This is Space Time Series 26, Episode 129, for broadcast on the 27th of October 2023. Coming up on Space Time, the largest ever Mars quake, the origins of organics on the dwarf planet Ceres, and is the asteroid Bennu spinning apart? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists have announced the results of a search for the source of the largest ever seismic event recorded on Mars. The study, led by the University of Oxford, rules out a meteorite impact, suggesting instead that the Mars quake was the result of enormous tectonic forces within the Martian crust. And of course the key there is that Mars doesn't have tectonic plates, at least not as far as we know. The quake, which had a magnitude of 4.7, caused vibrations to reverberate throughout the planet for six and a half hours. It was recorded by NASA's InSight lander back on May the 4th, 2022. Because its seismic signal was similar to previous quakes, which were known to be caused by meteoroid impacts, the authors believe that this event, dubbed S1222A, might have been caused by an impact as well. And so they launched a search for a fresh crater. Although Mars is smaller than Earth, it is a similar land surface area because it has no oceans. In order to survey this large area, around 144 million square kilometres, the study's lead author, Benjamin Fernando from the University of Oxford, sought contributions from the European Space Agency, the Chinese Space Agency, the Indian Space Research Organisation and the United Arab Emirates Space Agency. This is thought to be the first time that all these missions in orbit around Mars have collaborated on a single project. Each group examined data from their satellites orbiting Mars to look for any new craters or other telltale signatures of an impact, such as a dust cloud appearing the hours after the quake. But after several months of searching, the authors say there was no fresh crater found. They conclude that this event was instead caused by the release of enormous tectonic forces within the Martian interior. Their findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, indicate that the planet is much more seismically active than previously thought. Fernando says he still believes Mars doesn't have any active plate tectonics today, so this event was likely caused by the release of stress within the red planet's crust. These stresses are the results of billions of years of evolution, including the cooling and shrinking of different parts of the planet at different rates. Scientists still don't understand why some parts of the planet seem to have higher stresses than others, but results like these help with the investigation. One day, this information may help scientists better understand where it would be safe for humans to live on Mars, and what areas of the red planet you'd want to avoid. S-1222A was one of the last events recorded by NASA's InSight lander before it ended its mission in December 2022. The team are now moving forward by applying the knowledge from this study to future work, including upcoming missions to the Moon and to Saturn's moon Titan. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. Still to come, the origin of organics on the dwarf planet Ceres. And is the asteroid Bennu spinning apart? All that and more still to come on Space Time. One of the most exciting findings from NASA's Dawn mission is that the asteroid Ceres, the largest object in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, is host to complex organics. The discovery of alphatic molecules, which consist of carbon and hydrogen chains, in conjunction with evidence that Ceres has abundant water ice and may once have been an ocean world, means this dwarf planet may once have harboured the main ingredients associated with life as we know it. How the alphatic organics originated on Ceres has been the subject of intense research since their discovery in 2017. Some studies have concluded that a comet or other organic-rich impactor must have delivered them to Ceres, while others suggest that the molecules formed on the dwarf planet after its primordial materials were altered by briny water. 
But regardless of their origin, the organics on Ceres have been affected by impacts that have pot-marked its surface. Now, new research presented at the Geological Society of America's 2023 meeting is extending science's understanding of how impacts have affected Ceres alphatic molecules and what the implications are for determining their origin and assessing the dwarf planet's habitability. Tariq Daly from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory says the organics were initially detected in the vicinity of a large impact crater, which is what motivated his team to look for how these impacts affected these organics. And they're finding that the organics may be more widespread than first reported, and they seem to be resilient to impacts with Ceres-like conditions. From the dawn data, Daly knew that Ceres was covered with impact craters of varying sizes formed when other asteroids slammed into it. But what he did not yet understand was how these impacts affect alphatic compounds, information that was needed to help constrain where the organics originated from and how their signature might have changed after being exposed to multiple impacts over billions of years. Although scientists have performed impact shock experiments on various types of organics in the past, what was missing was a study dedicated to the type of organics detected on Ceres, using the same type of analytical method used by the Dawn spacecraft to detect them. This study says would enable direct comparisons between the experimental and spacecraft data. Dully worked with a team that included Jessica Sunshine, an astronomer with the University of Maryland, and Juan Rizos, an astrophysicist at the Institute of Astrophysics in Andalusia, Spain. They conducted a series of experiments at NASA's Ames Vertical Gun Range. The experiments mimic the impact conditions typical of Ceres, with impact speeds ranging from 2 to 6 kilometers per second, and impact angles varying from 15 to 90 degrees relative to horizontal. Rezos and Sunshine also conducted a new series of analyses that combined data from two different instruments, the camera and the imaging spectrometer, that both flew aboard the Dawn spacecraft, and then used an algorithm to extrapolate the compositional information from the spectrometer down to the camera's higher spatial resolution. The results allowed them to investigate the organics at finer detail than has previously been possible. People had looked at the Dawn camera data and the Dawn spectrometer data before, but no one had previously taken the approach to extrapolate the data from one instrument to the other, and this provided new leverage in the author's search to map and understand the origins of organics on Ceres. Collectively, the team's analysis points to some potentially exciting results. By capitalising on the strengths of two different data sets collected over Ceres, the authors were able to map potential organic-rich areas on the asteroid at high resolution. They say they can see some very good correlation of organics with units of older impacts and with materials like carbonates that also indicate the presence of water. While the origin of the organics still remains poorly understood, the authors now at least have some good evidence suggesting they formed on Ceres and likely in the presence of water. In fact, they speculate there's always the possibility that a large interior reservoir of organics could exist inside Ceres. Rizzo says the result increases the astrobiological potential of Ceres. And the authors hope that results from another NASA mission called Lucy could soon shed more light on organics in the solar system. Lucy's visiting Jupiter's Trojan asteroids, thought to be some of the oldest bodies in the solar system. Sunshine's also part of the Lucy mission team and has been thinking about how to apply the results of the current study to the Trojan asteroids that Lucy will be studying around Jupiter. She says they could likely find differences as the Trojan asteroids have experienced very different impact histories to Ceres and also because there are two compositionally different types of Trojan asteroids. Still, comparisons to Ceres will help astronomers better understand the distribution of organics in the outer solar system. This is space time. Still to come, is the asteroid Bennu spinning itself apart? And later in the science report, new observations point out that deadly bird flu viruses are now starting to break out in places outside Asia. All that and more still to come on space time.
Scientists studying data from the recently completed OSIRIS-REx mission to the near-Earth asteroid Bennu have found Alice in Wonderland-like physics governing the gravity of this tiny world's surface. The new findings are part of a suite of papers published by teams behind the OSIRIS-REx mission. A report in the journal Nature Astronomy by Daniel Shiraz and colleagues from the University of Colorado Boulder was able to determine Bennu's mass to be some 73 billion kilograms. The authors also developed a detailed map of the asteroid's gravitational pull. Their findings suggest that Bennu exists in a delicate balance between two competing forces, the result of the asteroid's wild spin. Bennu completes a full rotation about every four hours. Shiraz says those forces could play an important role in the asteroid's long-term evolution and potential demise. You see, when you spin Bennu up, you create a competition between the gravity that's holding the asteroid together and the centrifugal acceleration that's trying to rip the asteroid apart. To study those forces, Shiraz and colleagues used Osiris Rex's navigational instruments to measure the minute tug that the asteroid exerts on the spacecraft. And they dug up more than they expected. Now, based on the group's calculations, the region around Bennu's equator is trapped within a gravitational feature called a rotational Roche lobe, something scientists hadn't clearly observed on an asteroid until now. Now, in practice, that feature makes things really weird. If you're standing inside the boundaries of Bennu's Roche lobe and suddenly slipped over, not much would happen. You'd be captured by the lobe and fall back to the surface. But if you were outside the Roche lobe and slipped, you'd roll towards the equator. And if you could gain enough energy so that you'd roll off the equator, you may well end up in orbit, then out of space. It sounds like the sort of environment Lewis Carroll would appreciate. But it also matters for the lifespan of Bennu itself. That's because radiation from the sun is causing Bennu to spin ever faster. And as the asteroid's rotational rate builds up, its Roche lobe could be shrinking, along with the forces that are holding it together. Shiraz says that as the Roche lobe narrows further and further around the equator, it becomes easier and easier for the asteroid to lose material. So far, that material has been trapped by gravity. But at some point, if the asteroid keeps spinning faster, Shiraz says Bennu could be in the process of quite literally spinning itself into oblivion. The main role of the University of Colorado on the OSIRIS-REx mission is in the radio science experiment. The main result from radio science is actually to measure the mass and the gravity field of this asteroid. Bennu has a non-negligible probability of impacting the Earth uh, a few hundred years in the future. The ideal scenario is we take our very precise measurements, we'll be able to determine its location accurately enough so we can say, well, okay, it's going to miss the Earth by a far distance in in the future. If, in fact, that's not the case, then we need to start thinking about, well, how would we actually push this asteroid out of the way? You need time and you need to understand the, the, the properties of the asteroid. We're really getting some pristine material from the very dawn of the solar system and study it uh, uh, in, in a very detailed manner. That's Daniel Shiraz from the University of Colorado Boulder. And this is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Deadly bird flu virus outbreaks are now starting up in places outside Asia, including Europe and Africa, suggesting a shift in the global distribution of the virus. The deadly H5N1 virus first emerged in China in 1996. But it's now infecting and killing increasing numbers of wild birds and poultry, as well as posing an ever-growing risk to humans. Since 2014, there have been several outbreaks of similar bird flu viruses in the H5 group, and researchers found that while the 2016-17 outbreak started in China, two new H5 group viruses emerged from African and European countries, suggesting a shift in the H5's epicenter away from Asia. A report in the journal Nature suggests the increasing persistence of bird flu in the wild bird population is what's driving the evolution and spread of new strains. 
Researchers from Monash University have unlocked new insights into the behaviour of quantum impurities in materials. The new research, reported in the journal Physical Review Letters, introduces a novel approach known as the quantum viral expansion, which provides a new tool to uncover the complex quantum interactions in two-dimensional semiconductors. The authors say the breakthrough holds the potential to reshape science's understanding of complex quantum systems and to unlock new applications utilising novel 2D materials. Chinese scientists have genetically modified silkworms to produce spider silk, fibres six times stronger than Kevlar. As silkworm silk's the only animal silk fibre that's been commercialised on a large scale, the authors introduced the far stronger spider silk protein gene into the little worm's DNA. The material, reported in the journal Matter, could be used to manufacture environmentally friendly alternatives to common synthetic commercial fibres, including surgical sutures, clothing, bulletproof vests and military or aerospace technologies. German sceptics are waging a campaign to get a leading German medical journal to admit that they stuffed up an article on the pseudoscience of homeopathy by giving it credibility. After a year-long battle to try and get the magazine to publish a retraction, the journals now inform them that their application was not a priority that would justify publication. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the magazine's failure to act has triggered skeptics to publish their own paper on the justification of criticism of homeopathy and highlight the disinterest and indifference towards the pseudoscience being run by the magazine. The German skeptics have been investigating homeopathy a lot because it, it was founded in Germany a couple of hundred years ago, a couple of hundred plus years ago, by a fellow named Hahnemann, who developed this theory that like can cure like, which is a bit weird anyway, and that increasingly diluted forms of the treatment object, the thing that works, if you increase increasingly diluted, it will actually become more effective rather than less effective, which is what you would think. And they dilute it in a really weird way. It's called succussion. And you have to sort of put like a drop of this solution of a particular product. It could be a herbal product. It could be a mineral product. It could be a whole range of different things, supposedly specifically to treat particular conditions. And you drop it in some liquid, like a dropper in liquid. You shake it up. You bash it on a, well, you should say you bash it on a copy of the Bible because it's a leather-bound book. And then you take a dropper that and put it in some other sort of clean liquid, you know, pure liquid, and then you do it again, and you do it again, and you keep taking a drop of these, these, the solution and put it in a new bit. But eventually, there's so little left of the original treatment that there's nothing there. You do this 30 times, and if you look at some labels on homeopathic product, they'll have a 30C, which indicates how many times this dilution has been done. And when you get down to that level, there is literally nothing left of the original. There's no molecules left of it. So the suggestion that a dilution works doesn't. It cannot. Physics says stop. You have to rewrite the entire physics to make that work. Secondly, the sort of things they use to like treat like, you know, they would suggest if you have lead poisoning, you take lead. The most humorous example I ever saw was if you're suffering from barriers to your life, to your psychological problems, you should take a bit of wall. And they were using the Berlin Wall. Take a little tincture of the Berlin Wall, make that into a solution, 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 and that would help you treat barriers in your life. Berlin Wall, because it was knocked down, of course, so you're knocking down barriers. And it's totally ludicrous on several levels. If there's one area of medicine the skeptics say is 100% wrong, it's homeopathy. Right. So the German skeptics are trying to tell people that, especially the learned journals and things. And they approached a uh, journal called Pediatric Research, which has a reasonable profile in medical fields. And they pointed out a particular paper that they said it was wrong. It's full of errors in various ways that the numbers don't add up of the results. And yet the paper then said they wouldn't publish their criticism because the priority given to it was not sufficient to justify publication. And you think, well, how do you work out the priority? You know, sort of surely if you're pointing out that a paper is wrong, the journal should publish that fact but they well, said no 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 morally they'd have an obligation to do so they do. If they're a reputable <laughs> exactly. journal. They do. If they're a reputable journal, they do it. But they held it off for a year and then decided, oh, no, it's too late now. But they said at least you should put in thing that there was a, a warning on this paper that it has been, if you, even if you don't retract it, just say put a warning on it that, that there have been arguments raised that, you know, it's, it's not good. But the issue here is not just that homeopathy is a junk science, but also that the publications don't want to retract stuff, especially in Germany, which is where the home of homeopathy is. So this German skeptics group was sort of bashing their head against the wall. It's a big problem when the publications themselves don't want to admit that they published a dodgy piece of work. What is it, funding for these magazines that's preventing them from doing this? Or? Reputation, it's sales. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics.
that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 